everyone. Thank you for uh, attending this presentation. <laughs> um, I'm Claire Vacherot. I'm a pen tester and researcher at Orange Cyber Defense in France. Um, I have two main activities. The first consists in penetration testing in the shore systems. And when I'm not doing this, I do research on how to penetration test in the shore devices. Um, so this is what we are going to talk about today. Uh, this presentation will be about uh, protocol gateways. Uh, that's a shortcut for um, industrial uh, pro uh, devices that do translation uh, between um, industrial network protocols. Sorry, I'm going to say industrial a lot. <laughs> uh, so first, I'm going to um, introduce more what they are. Uh, then I present uh, the research I did on one of them. It's on stage, actually, but the demo won't be live <laughs> because it's not even plugged in. Um, and then uh, we'll um, discuss the, these results. So first of all, some context. Uh, now we know more what industrial systems are, but still. Uh, for me, the set of hardware and software components that have a physical effect on their environments. Um, so you can find them, of course, in factories. Uh, but actually, it's everywhere. Uh, you can find them, for instance, in uh, transportation. <laughs> Uh, also um, in buildings with some sort of automations and uh, a lot of other places. So these industrial systems that we will call OT for operational technology are usually linked one way or another to the IT uh, we know of, um, at least for data exchange. On this OT, you can have uh, servers and workstations, the same as in IT, but with a few differences, of course. And you can also have industrial devices specific to the industrial world. Um, for instance, PLCs, HMIs, etc. So this is a very simplified view, as you can see. But um, there's more, of course. But here, we don't need to know more. So these devices are connected using different types of links. You have the LAN. Um, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and so on. And you have, you can have uh, also other types of links. Uh, for instance, serial, radio, uh, which I grouped into the name field. And of course, on these links, devices communicate with each other using protocols. Uh, so you have IT protocol uh, such as SSH, SMB, um, FTP, and so on. And you also have OT protocols. So as you can. Imagine uh, they are specific to the industrial world. They are used to monitor, configure, and control industrial processes. Uh, they are on different type of links, uh, IP-based or not. Um, one important thing to note first is that a lot of them have been, uh, are very old, actually, and they have been built when cybersecurity was not a thing. And the other important thing to note is that there are many of them uh, because it depends on the manufacturers, the type of industry, uh, the type of link, the type of usage, and so on. Um, usually when they build industrial systems, they try to use devices that use the same languages, but from time to time there's this one device uh, that they require, but that use a different protocol. And in this case, you uh, may use an intermediate device to do the translation. Uh, this is what industrial protocol translation gateways are for. So basically, uh, there is protocol A on one side, protocol B on the other side, and the gateway does the translation. It's as simple as that. In our OT, it would most likely be located um, in, among other industrial uh, devices. For instance, here it makes a communication between uh, device one and two on the LAN and it can also be on the field. So I really wanted to test this type of device because, uh, first of all, I often see them during penetration tests, so I, so I know they are being used in the real uh, world. Also, they play an important role in an industrial process because they make the communication possible between components, uh, but as they do not do anything in it, it's easy to forget them. Uh, also, uh, they, as they implement uh, translation for protocols, this means that they have parsers for this protocol. 
uh, they can be very complicated. Sometimes the code is uh, very old and it may not uh, implement well enough malform requests, which is uh, interesting for uh, attackers. So my initial idea was to test such a device uh, from a position when I can, uh, where I can only reach it uh, on the network, no physical access. We'll see why uh, later. Um, for me, this is the most likely position uh, for an attacker um, because uh, uh, the, an attacker could have reached the OT network and, theref and the device on the OT network uh, either from the IT or from the internet. Uh, from there, I could just send malicious requests. They would probably be uh, already interpreted and translated by the device. But here I wanted to go further, and I wanted to uh, find vulnerabilities in protocol implementation, so the parsers, um, to make the device do things it's not supposed to do. Um, namely, I wanted it to uh, make it alter itself uh, with legitimate data exchange between legitimate devices uh, in the industrial process. Another uh, thing I, I could uh, imagine is uh, to use it as a foothold uh, in the industrial system for other types of attacks. So this is my test device. Uh, this is the uh, Anibus X gateway by the vendor HMS Network. It's not the latest model, but um, it's quite common. Um, they, uh, this model has uh, many different combinations of protocols for different tr translations. Um, mine, they all rely on the same base. That's important. <laughs> um, mine has on one side Ethernet IP. Uh, it's not obvious, but it's the name of an industrial protocol. The IP actually stands for industrial protocol. And on the other side, you have uh, Profibus on the serial link. Uh, why go with this translation? Um, because I found this one on eBay, but it could have been something else, actually. So, to start testing it, of course, I started by reading the, the documentation, disassemble it, use it uh, to know it better. Then I reassembled it and <laughs> plugged it on the, the same network as me to be in the, in the position we talked about earlier. Um, so, usually when you start testing a device from the network, you start with network discovery. So, of course, I did the Nmap scan. Uh, we can see we have a few ports open. First of all, we have IT administration services. So, we have FTP, Telnet, and HTTP. On HTTP, uh, we have access to this web interface for uh, configuration, to configure the device. It's uh, not encrypted, it's not authenticated, but uh, we'll talk about that later. On Telnet, we have access to a very restricted shell. Actually, I couldn't do anything with this. Uh, by the way, uh, you can already notice a few things that seem wrong, uh, but I will not get into the details here. <laughs> um, on the FTP, we have access to part of the file system. And this includes, for instance, uh, the um, web pages for the web interface that we've just seen. And for instance, we have uh, this, reboot.html, which is kind of weird. So let's just try to browse it using Firefox and see what happens. You can see on the right side that there's my device. And it rebooted. Uh, it was brief, but the uh, light all turned red. So calling this web page actually reboots the device. So that's interesting. Now what if I do this? Uh, that's to say calling the web page over uh, and over again. And it does exactly what you think. It uh, keeps on rebooting the device. That's also very interesting. <laughs> So I did ignore the previous issues, uh, but this one, this means that uh, anyone reaching the device on the network can trigger this vulnerability very easily, uh, anonymously, and make the device unavailable. And to stop uh, the attack, you either need to find the source of the attack or to restrict the malicious traffic, but, which is not as easy as it seems. 
So that's one. <laughs> uh, we are still uncovering Nmap results. Um, we also have in, uh, ports open for industrial network protocols. So 502 is for Modbus. The other ones are all for Ethernet IP. Um, this is our main target, so we'll just keep them and save them for, for later. We also have this port, 3250, uh, which is um, it for HICP, the proprietary protocol used by the vendor to uh, discover and configure their devices on the network. So it's, for instance, used by this uh, tool, HMS IP config. So this is a very simple protocol. It has only a few commands available. It's ASCII-based. Um, it's in clear text, of course. Uh, you can set a password, but it's not set by default, and as it's in clear text, you can eavesdrop it anyway. So this means here that, uh, once again, anyone uh, reaching the device on the network can use this protocol directly uh, to change uh, the network configuration of the device anonymously. And by the way, you can also do this with the web interface. But uh, um, uh, Changing the network configuration may not seem like a big deal, but um, if you do that, uh, the device is not reachable anymore on the network of course, uh, so the, the other devices that, uses it, that use it for uh, translation uh, cannot use it anymore, so the translation stops, and uh, possibly uh, it will possibly disrupt the industrial process in which uh, they are involved. Um, the vendor, HMS Networks, was aware of these issues uh, long before I published, uh, I reported, sorry, the vulnerabilities, uh, they released HICPS, which does not have this problem, but it's uh, not supported by my device, only on newer versions, uh, so mine will just stay uh, vulnerable. So, <laughs> back to the discovery, we are still uh, on Nmap. This talk is all about that, I guess. Um, there's only one more to go, last but not least. Uh, port 7412. Um, on TCP and UDP, and I have no idea what it is, still. <laughs> I found nothing in the, doc in the documentation, uh, nothing online. Uh, the vendor never told me. I couldn't find out by reverse engineering it, uh, because it's a very weird architecture. Um, so, of course, to try to discover what it was, I tried sending random requests, expecting a response. Uh, it, ne it never came, of course. But, at some point, I noticed that after some time, the device stopped uh, responding. So after a 10-minute investigation, uh, it turns out that all the network services of the device stopped responding after sending 85 requests uh, to this port. Uh, the content does not really matter. So let me show you. This is not very impressive, as you can imagine, but still. <laughs> so we still have our device on the right side. We see that we ping it. Then we run the attack, just sending 85 requests containing zeros. Um, and then we can try to ping the device again, and it does not ping anymore. But it still blinks like it's fine. So for me, this one is the worst. Um, of course, the condition remains the same. Uh, anim anonymous access from the network, very easy to trigger. Uh, the effect is the same, uh, denial of service. The device does not respond. But here, to recover from the attack, you uh, need to reboot the device. But you cannot do it from the network, because it does not respond. <laughs> so you have to do it uh, physically. Uh, but such device is in cabinets such as this one, usually. They are not always very easy to reach physically. And also the device uh, does not have a power button, uh, so you have to unplug it from the power supply. Um, fortunately, this one has a way to do it without touching the wire, which is a good thing. Uh, but still, it can be hard to reach depending on the location. So what do we have so far? 
uh, we have three vulnerabilities. One relies on calling a web page, another one on sending random requests, and the last one on using a protocol. Uh, they can be used by anyone connected to the same network and reaching the device on the network. As they are not uh, related to translation, uh, this means that um, they apply to all any bus gateways of the same model regardless of the translation. And with this, you can very easily uh, make the device unavailable and uh, you can then alter or stop the industrial process or part of it, which seems bad. <laughs> so at that point, it seemed um, like a good time to report it. Uh, it even seems superfluous to, to go further. <laughs> uh, I could even have added uh, more vulnerabilities. With, you've seen some uh, things <laughs> during, the, during the previous slides. There's more, uh, but here I chose to focus on these three because they can be used for trivial attacks with direct consequences. So I contacted the vendor, but first, I uh, wondered, should I publish these trivial vulnerabilities? I think some of you might think it's a dumb question <laughs> because um, in, offensive, in offensive security, we are used to see uh, awesome uh, attack demonstration, uh, very complex, we're requiring high technical skills, so I felt like a fraud. <laughs> but I... Um, I remember that I um, search vulnerabilities for them to be fixed, <laughs> no matter how challenging it is to uh, find and to exploit them. Um, this is not because the technical level is uh, here is uh, so low <laughs> that it's almost frustrating, uh, that it's not interesting to share them because it does not have a technical impact um, in, a, in the real world. Uh, for instance, uh, in this uh, excellent talk <laughs> by my colleague uh, Rick, um, he talks about uh, very cool attack demos on industrial systems, and he insists on the fact that uh, a lot of them are um, so sophisticated that a real-world adversary would need to build a very complex attack val valid only for a very specific target, and uh, they, they would need to to know the underlying industrial process well enough uh, to be able to fine-tune the attack while avoiding side effects. So, this happens, <laughs> unfortunately, but this requires highly motivated uh, attackers, uh, probably state-driven, uh, so it's not, uh, it's not very common. But of course, when this happens, uh, it can have way more precise, long-lasting, stealthy, dangerous results and everything. <laughs> So the vulnerabilities I am presenting today are the exact opposite of that. Uh, they can be used for uh, very basic attacks, even accidental, <laughs> really. Um, the outcome uh, would probably be something related to blindly crashing stuff, uh, but it's very easy to set up, so I'm confident that anyone could do this. So what I'm trying to say here is that both approaches and uh, all the other approaches, of course, uh, are uh, relevant uh, because they cover different types of real life uh, attacks and adversary. Uh, oh, and also that uh, sometimes it's okay to present shitty vulnerabilities uh, because uh, in the end, who knows what my uh, random crashes could do to an industrial system. So back to the disclosure, uh, I contacted the vendor, the CVA got registered, they got disclosed, everything went fine. Now for the remediation, of course. Um, in theory, we could think of something related to uh, fixing the vulnerabilities. Um, unfortunately, here one of them cannot be uh, patched, and the two other obviously uh, rely on uh, installing updates. Um, this can be very hard to do in industrial systems because you cannot just stop uh, an industrial process to install an update or you cannot update a component in a running environment, well, an environment that works uh, because then it may not work so well anymore and can have dangerous side effects. So what did the vendor do in the end? 
uh, they added a supplement in the documentation um, saying that the device should be installed in a secure environment. And they encourage uh, customers to um, replace their device with the new version. In a way, this is understandable, provided what we've just said about updates and all. Uh, but I still have a few things to say about that. The first thing is that, uh, I remember I said that uh, the whole gateway of this model rely on the same base with different translation. Uh, mine as a replacement, but it's not true for all over trans for many other translation uh, that will not be replaced. Um, so they will just stay vulnerable. Um, also, device with, with a replacement would probably not be replaced for the same reason they would not be updated. And the last thing is that by providing a supplement, the vendor makes it the customer's uh, responsibility only to ensure the security of the device. So, of course, customers have their share to do uh, for security too, but it's better if both the vendor and the, cyber and the customer make effort in the cybersecurity process. Okay. <laughs> um, so, this means that uh, many other, many devices uh, like this one in industrial systems uh, will not be replaced for a while. So if you have one, um, the best uh, remediation I can think of is network segmentation. Uh, if a device cannot be hardened for whatever reason, because it cannot be patched, because it does not have security features, because it uses weak protocols and so on, uh, it's better if no one can reach it on the network. Uh, for me, this is the most important uh, recommendation when, when it comes to industrial systems because there are many other devices uh, like this one uh, or application or protocols or even practices <laughs> that are far behind in, in terms of cybersecurity. So let's wrap things up. Um, this device is one of many examples of what we can see in industrial systems, even nowadays. Uh, during penetration tests, I often see uh, things that I hoped uh, disappeared 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, these vulnerabilities fall into this category, uh, but I think they should still be uh, shared and discussed to make things move. Um, so if you want more information, uh, I wrote an article uh, with the details of the vulnerabilities. And um, now uh, what is uh, the next step? Now I need to uh, go back to the research and uh, maybe start doing what I was supposed to do in, in the beginning. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, OT, we have a question already. Thank you, very interesting talk, uh, and it's not trivial, so no. Uh, so the equivalent of these boxes in the IT world exists with, uh, for instance, uh, HTTP translator from HTTP 2 to 1, or uh, also caching device. I mean, there are lots of different middle boxes, right? And, and they are well known to have uh, vulnerabilities because they fail in doing the proper translation or sometimes because the protocol itself has not taken into consideration the existence of a middle box and doesn't say what they are supposed to do when translating. Mm -hmm. So you have HTTP smuggling and uh, cache poisoning and all these kinds of things. Do you think these gateways would be vulnerable to the same kind of issues with translations? And have you started looking at that as well? Uh, I didn't know about uh, this type of equipment, so thank you first. Um, I'm, I don't know, I haven't checked, but I, I don't see why they wouldn't be there, uh, because uh, I was talking about um, protocols, uh, OT protocols, a lot of them are old. Um, they, uh, they have the same flaws as IT protocols uh, that... Uh, we are now we now consider weak, uh, so I really don't see why they wouldn't be vulnerable as well. But it needs to be confirmed as well. <laughs> uh, 
So thanks for what you are doing here. But to me, this is just confirming what we already know in, in critical infrastructure. If you, Michael Wink of ICS Reigns always say, says, if you can't hack, hack a Mokta device or a Siemens device or whatever, industrial device, then I can't use you. And, mm -hmm. and that's because it's so easy. So, yes. so thanks for your <laughs> emphasis on, on segmenting the network. Would, would you agree that we should actually not just segment it, but maybe use data diodes or unidirectional gateways, as the youth call it uh, these days? Oh, sorry, could you just repeat the, the last part? <laughs> the, the data, uh, using a data diode to actually really separate it, or unidirectional gateways, uh, some call them today, to ensure that it's one-way traffic out. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yes. The question, a any uh, help is uh, welcome, I think. But yes, uh, actually, it's not it's not new at all. But uh, as I, I as we said, OT has uh, flaws that uh, are still there, but they shouldn't be there. But they are still there. <laughs> and that's because our, for example, energy infrastructure is 30 years old. And if you lifetime extend a wind turbine or a, a nuclear plant, it's mm -hmm. for another 30 years, or at least for yes. some of them, maybe five years. So. It can't be changed. It would be vastly expensive. You wouldn't be grid compliant. So, so I think this is important research. But please put emphasis on all the um, things you can do, and don't just say segmentation because then we, uh, then people end up with arguing. Oh, we have VLANs and some port-based firewalling it, and that's not up to snuff in 2024. So, so my question is: Are you there? Would would, would you mind writing about that as well? Add that to your research. Really protect it instead of just playing IT protection. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe. But um, um, yes, you can add things. But you can. For me, the first thing to do is to make sure that the architecture is right. Yeah. Then you can add things. But that, of course, of course, this yeah. is important. The architecture <laughs> was my point. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Congratulations. Great talk. Um, we all know there's a lot of stuff connected to the internet that shouldn't. Uh, do you have a sense if these types of devices are directly exposed also to the internet, and how much? Uh, there are a lot of them. <laughs> um, the, um, I, I re really I can't you give you numbers. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much for bringing the pleasant memories. <laughs> but on a serious note, you mentioned a weird architecture. Which one was it? Oh, sorry, can you repeat? <laughs> uh, you mentioned that the, the chip had the weird architecture. I'm curious which one. Oh, yeah, uh, I can find the name. Uh, actually, I'm really not an expert, far from this. So I ask a few friends of mine who know uh, way better than I do. It was a Renaissance something. Um, uh, and when I told them what it was, they just say, oh, this is uh, hard. So <laughs> I was just like, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not sure I want to, um, to go further, but I can tell you the exact uh, name after, if you want. All right, thank you. Uh, I think indirectly uh, your presentation raises uh, similar questions for, I mean, a bit different questions in, in regards to penetration testing or, or auditing production networks that run these type of devices. Uh, I guess we all remember the good old days where we did a port scan of a network and printers spit, spitted out papers. I guess here the impact is a bit much more dramatic if you accidentally crash a production system with a whole could just be a production chain or even worse. Um, so I'm wondering, um, how are you approaching that challenge in like, in one way you need to be able to do a kind of a, an audit or penetration test on a production network one way or another. And you probably don't have all those devices, uh, a, a duplicate of the devices so you can play around with them in a safe environment. So how, how are you doing it and how would you recommend other people to, to approach that challenge? Thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, actually, I could do a whole presentation about this subject. <laughs> um, yes, uh, you cannot just uh, test uh, an industrial system the way you uh, test industrial, uh, sorry, IT, uh, because 
the device are more fragile. They use different types of uh, components. Uh, and also behind there's an industrial process uh, this, or several. This can be very dangerous depending on the type. So um, uh, if you can test outside of production in test environments, it's always better. Uh, but if you cannot, of course, it's important to, ad to adapt uh, the, the technique so uh, we don't do intrusive tests. So I know that sounds weird for, the for a penetration test. But uh, we try to avoid uh, having too much traffic. Uh, we try also to discuss with customers to make sure we avoid uh, critical devices uh, and things like that. We do. We have techniques for um, uh, light <laughs> network discovery, so uh, the way of th things to to know the most about the device, but without uh, flooding it with uh, uh, the the. With all the, the fingerprinting you, you can, actually we cannot fingerprint like, just like this. So yes, there are a lot of things to, to know um, before that. And my recommendation if you want to do pen, uh, penetration tests on industrial systems is first, don't touch anything until you know what you have in front of you. All right, with that, no more questions. If you have more, I, I see uh, here it's a popular topic, but please outside because we need to move to the next one, unfortunately. So thanks, Claire. Thank you.